It's great to see everyone here this morning. We have a number of folks who are visiting with us today. We're glad that you're here. We also have a number of folks who are out of town and uh, away from us for various reasons today. <clears throat> we are reminded this morning as we come together for this period of worship what a, what a blessing and a joy it is for those who are the children of God to be in the company of one another so that we can blend our hearts and our voices together in singing praise and praying together uh, in studying the word together in eating the supper of the Lord together. We're glad that you're here. Among those who are visiting with us, the Goddards are here today. And uh, I just want to tell you, the last time I saw them was in Rome, Italy. Uh, they were visiting there with Bob and Martha Sneed. They were doing some traveling with them. Bob Sneed was one of the elders of the uh, College View Church in Florence at the time. And <clears throat> Bob and Martha and the Goddards are very... Uh, Friends through, through the years have just been the closest of friends. Bob uh, went on to be with the Lord some, some time ago. I'm glad to see the Goddards here. We were eating together at Stefano's home, I believe, Stefano and Antonella. We were with them. Uh, so it's a, it's a joy to see them here and to have them with us uh, this morning. I want to, uh, this morning... <clears throat> spend some time talking with you about the reality of life and, and what it means to be a real Christian. And, and uh, I, I just began, we're, we're going to be in James, the first chapter, as you may have ascertained from the scripture reading this morning. I have been for some time studying the book of James, uh, doing some analytical work on the book and preparing uh, to teach some homiletical studies as well from the book uh, during the grotto studies that are coming up in just about three weeks now. And so I'm excited about that. But this morning I'll, I'll grab one of those themes and uh, talk with you about it just for a few minutes this morning. James, as he is writing to Christians in the first century, is, is saying to them in essence, look, we are born for battle. I'm talking about spiritually born. We are born for battle. If you had this idea that once you became a Christian, all the conflicts and the problems that you know go along with life and this, all of those conflicts and problems are going to be over. James said, "You've got the wrong idea." And so immediately, immediately as he opens this epistle, he immediately begins to talk about the right attitude toward trials and tribulations that are faced in this life. The new birth into Jesus, it, it does not resolve all the conflict. In fact, it really introduces us to new conflict. Because now our, our commitment is serving God, glorifying God, following Jesus, and we have become special targets of Satan in all of this. Now, I, I say that to say that if in your life right now you're struggling with some problems and, and at times you have, you have been wont to, to say to yourself, you know, what's wrong? What, what, what is going on here? I, I'm serving the Lord. I'm faithful. I, I tr I'm, I'm trusting God. And it seems like every time I turn around, something's going wrong. So, I, one more piece of bad news. James, as he introduces the text, he said, listen. Fact of the matter is, <clears throat> you're going to face trials and tribulations in life. Christians are, there's no question about this. Christians are a special people. But folks, we're not a protected species in this life. And, and as we are living life under the sun, James is saying to the Christians, look, you, you need to be mentally and spiritually prepared for the reality of 
uh, of the problems and the challenges that are coming, there, there are two kinds. There are some that come from without. The tribulations and the trials of life itself. I'm talking about broken relationships. I'm talking about uh, being, being wronged. I, I'm talking about uh, the, the realities, the sufferings in this life that result from sickness and disease. I'm talking about suffering that comes from socioeconomic realities. And when those who have uh, uh, oppress and take advantage of those who have not, I'm talking about the, the injustice and the unfairness that, that takes place in life. When individuals take advantage of other people. James said, this is the reality of life under the sun in a sinful world. But folks, that is not the totality of our struggles. And that is not, that, that is not even perhaps the biggest burden that we are facing in this life. I, I think for, for some of us that the, the great surprise may have been once we became a Christian, dedicated ourselves to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, it seems like that carnal nature, that carnal man, those, the, the lusts and the desires of, of the flesh that are within us, it seems like suddenly they, they erupt within us with an enormous strength and power. And all of a sudden, we feel like we are at war inside of ourselves. And James is saying to these Christians, this is the real Christian life. It is a life of battle. It is a life of conflict. Jesus, in preparing his own disciples, <coughs> He, he, had, he had some concern that they were going to have some mistaken notions about what kingdom life would be like. And so he said to them, look, do, do you think I'm calling you to an easy life? Jesus, Jesus never pretended that he was calling us to an easy life. He was calling us to a better life but not necessarily an easier life. There's a difference. And so he said to his disciples, do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set a man at variance against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will, are, are going to become those of his own household. Time out. I just want to ask you. Has your commitment to the truth of the gospel of Christ ever created conflict in your immediate or extended family? Have there been any family relationships that have been strained or even broken because you made an un, unwavering commitment that you were going to follow Jesus Christ in truth. I think a lot of you sitting out there would say yes. That you know something of the conflict that is created even within family relationships because of this. I, I, I'm saying that if, if we are coming to Christ thinking that, oh wow, to be a Christian, it just means the greatest life in the world. It does mean that. It just means the most wonderful life. It is a wonderful life. It just means no problem. No, no, it does not just mean no problems 
and no conflicts. That's what James is saying. And he's saying part of the problem that you're having and underlying the disillusionment that you are experiencing is this notion, that this false notion, that when you became a Christian, that this conflict and these sufferings were, were suddenly going to end, and now that you're a Christian, everything is just going to be wonderful. The Apostle Paul, you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when he was, <clears throat> he was addressing the false teachers, he was talking about his, <laughs> the reality of his suffering to do the work of an apostle among them. And uh, <laughs> he was shaming, really, the false teachers who were impugning his motives and suggesting things about him that absolutely were not true. And Paul said, you can look at my life, and I'll tell you, he said, I'm not in this for, for personal gain. This isn't about, uh, I'm living the good life at your expense. And then Paul goes through the whole litany of sufferings that he has endured in order to carry the truth of the gospel of Christ on his lips to various places like Corinth. Now, James, when he's writing this epistle, he's writing to repudiate a kind of first century pop Christianity that says, hey, become a Christian and life is going to be great. James is saying, life is going to be blessed. But you need to pray for wisdom as you endure the trials and the tribulations of life under the sun. So why, why do we struggle so much as Christians with, with, with the realities of this life when, when something happens to us, when, when our hearts have been broken, when our bodies are, are, are just writhing in, in pain. Why do we struggle so much? Well, one reason we struggle is because at least from our perspective in life under the sun, from the perspective of life under the sun, life seems so unfair. It just seems so unfair. And, and the writer of Ecclesiastes said, you know, here's the problem. It, it happened to, to the righteous what, what the wicked deserved. And, and the wicked ended up getting what the righteous deserved. It just, it just didn't seem fair. The psalmist in Psalm 73 write, writes a beautiful psalm. And it is a psalm about his struggle with the inequities of life. He starts out with the truth, just like a Christian would. He starts out by saying, he makes his confession. I know. So he's saying, look, you, you don't have to tell me this. You don't have to remind me of this. It's not like I don't know this. I know that God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. I know that God is good. That's not the problem here. The problem is not that I've never learned that God is good. I have learned that. Here's the problem. In my experience in life, it has seemed to me at times that even though God is good, it has seemed to me at times that God is not good to me. And the psalmist said, look, my feet had almost slipped. I had almost stumbled. My steps had almost slipped. I, I looked around me. I saw the wicked. They, they, were, they were happy. They were smiling. Their lives were great. Everything was wonderful for them. 
They made no pretense of honoring God. They made no pretense of serving God. They made no pretense of seeking after truth. And then I looked at my life. I, I love the Lord. I've tried to serve the Lord. I've tried to teach my children about the Lord. And we've just had one problem after another, one sickness after another. We're struggling with this right now. And then this happened to us. And then yesterday, I found out about this. And I'm just telling you, life is just coming in all on top. And sometimes it seems like the person who has no faith at all is living the wonderful life. And the people of faith are doing all this. So I say it seems like that because in reality, in reality, we, we don't know what other people are dealing with and what their struggles are all of the time. But there are times when we are hurting that it seems like that. We struggle with what James is saying because life sometimes seems so unfair. And, and the second reason we struggle is because sometimes the truth of the matter is sometimes life just hurts. And there's no need to pretend that it doesn't. I, <laughs> I can tell you, I never really, uh, in my life I've never really had much sickness or pain or any physical malady of, of substance to, to deal with up until th this past year. But I did learn something this past year. When, when you are really, really hurting and in pain, the last thing in the world you need is for some well-intentioned person to walk into the room and tell you, oh, it's not that bad. Yeah, it is. It was really bad. I, I, I want somebody who's going to be honest about that. It, it was really bad. Sometimes life hurts. You remember when Jesus got to the grave, to the tomb of Lazarus? The, the text says all, all the friends were gathered there they, they were weeping. Jesus looked at them. He looked at their tears. He understood their sorrow. Their hearts were broken. And Jesus wept. He wept because life hurts sometimes. The Apostle Paul said in 1 uh, Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, He said, I, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that you sorrow not even as the world who has no hope. Pa Paul didn't say that we do not sorrow when, when those who are near and dear to us pass from this life. He didn't say there's no sorrow with that. Even Jesus recognized the sorrow that is associated with that. Paul said... We don't sorrow like the world sorrows. But we sorrow because life sometimes hurts. And truthfully, we struggle with our problems in life sometimes because we just think we deserve better. I mean, it's not like we're going around, you know, praying to God and say, you owe me one here. But there, there are times when we are hurting and suffering and, and there are problems and trials that are absolutely breaking us in half. And we look around and we see the unbeliever whose life looks like a dream. And it's hard for us not to think that in reality we deserve a little better than that. Let, let me tell you something. Jesus, when he was preparing his disciples for what was coming, he, <laughs> he took them out to the garden. They, he prayed with them. He prayed for them. Well, 
As he prayed, one of the things he prayed was for the Father to keep them from the evil one. One of the things he said to them was, you guys need to remember something. A servant is not greater than his Lord. And Jesus said, you need to remember that when you're hurting and you're suffering. It's not like, no, it doesn't really hurt. No, it really hurts. It's not like, oh, it's not that bad. It may be really bad. But Jesus said, you need to remember something. A servant is not greater than his Lord. I, I suffered. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. They were going to be the objects of persecution. But they're going to suffer in other ways uh, as well. We, we struggle, not only because we think we deserve better, we struggle at times because we just don't understand why. And, and we go through this, why me? And why this? And why now? We just don't understand why. Sometimes we have a great, a great desire to answer that question of why, but the reality is there are some questions in life that are not going to be answered in this life. There, there are some moments in life when we're walking through the darkness of the valley, even the sh in the shadow of death. And we are not going to understand why it has to be this way at this time. It's important for us to realize that God's first concern with us in, in those moments is not to explain the why of the situation. Okay, David, here, sit down. I know you're struggling with this. I, I really want you to understand this. That's not his first concern. I, I'll tell you what my Lord wants in that situation. He wants to know, am I going to reach out and take his hand and walk with him even through the valley of the shadow of death? Not because I understand, not, not because it doesn't hurt, not because I'm not sorrowful. He wants to know if I'm going to take his hand and walk with him in faith just because I trust Him. That's what He wants to know. He wants to know if I really, really trust Him. James, as he is addressing these things with, with these Christians, he appeals to them for a new perspective. He said, Look, when, when the trials and the tribulations come, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet the trials of various kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. He didn't say that trials are joyful. He said that you can find joy in the moment because you understand that the difficulties and the trials and the sorrows this is God's way of bringing you to maturity and you are learning perseverance and faith and you are being strengthened as you walk this journey. You need a new perspective on this. The fact that you're suffering does not mean that God has abandoned you or that something is going wrong with my Christian life. The real Christian lives a life rejoicing in the Lord, but he deals with the realities of life. And he does so with the understanding that God is with him and he's bringing him to maturity. 
in all of this. You remember in Acts 5 and verse 41, after the apostles had been arrested for the second time, all of them, and, and now they've been beaten and they've been charged again not to teach or preach anymore in the, in the name of Jesus, and they go out. And the text says they went out rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord. So I said, oh, the, the, they, they didn't even feel it because they were suffering. For, oh, they felt it, folks. It hurt. They were bleeding. Their skin was laid open. The flesh was torn. They were rejoicing, not because it didn't hurt. They were rejoicing because they saw the bigger picture here. James is calling for a new perspective. He, he's calling for sincere compassion. And he reminds us of his own compassion for others and the compassion of God, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4. He reminds us we do not have a high priest in heaven the one who is interceding for us with God. We don't have a high priest who doesn't get it. We have a high priest who has been in every point like us. He's been challenged, yet without sin. And because of that, the writer of Hebrews said, we can approach the throne of God with confidence and boldness, understanding that we have a mediator, a high priest, who understands exactly what we are suffering. What James calls for is a trusting dependence on God. You know, <clears throat> I... When I'm in my dark, difficult moments of life, I really appreciate a brother like James. Because he's a brother who not only will pray for me, he'll cry with me. He's a brother who not only will intellectually acknowledge my plight, but he emotionally identifies with my pain. He, he's a brother who, when he comes, he doesn't lie to me about my problem. He doesn't say, oh, you're not really sick. I am sick. This isn't really a problem. No, it is a problem. He's candid and he's honest, but he is compassionate. And he's caring. And he strengthens my faith and dependence on God. Just as Jonathan did. When he went to David, he found him out in the woods. And he strengthened his hand in God. Good counsel from one brother to another, from one sister to another in Christ. Good counsel leads people to center their thoughts and their lives on God, even in the darkness of the valleys. <clears throat> There's a false impression that folks have, and We've seen it a lot in the religious world around us. A false impression that is not new. It was around in the first century. It was the impression, erroneous as it was, that if you become a Christian, everything's just going to be perfect and wonderful in your life. That's not what God promised. God promised, if you, if you trust me, if you come to me, you find your salvation in me, I'll take your hand. I will walk with you every step of the way. We, we will go through the good times together. We will go through the darkness and the fires together. And here's the promise. 
and when we get to the end of the way, I'm bringing you home. That's the promise. Aren't you glad we're going home? If you're here this morning and not a Christian, what, what, what a wonderful promise the Lord has laid out there in front of us. Uh, what, what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity he's given to us to come and lay our burdens at his feet and allow him to take them and walk with us every step of the way. If you've never confessed Jesus as the Son of God and put on the Lord in baptism, you can do that this morning. And if you're a child of God who needs to come home to the Lord, won't you come right now while we stand and sing?